In this video, I'm going to give you all of the information necessary to get a great score on the abstract reasoning section of the UCAT. UCAT abstract reasoning is famously the hardest section, and looking at questions like this or this, I really don't see why people say that. It's also meant to be super time pressured, where to answer 50 multiple choice questions, you have 12 minutes. This gives you about 14.4 seconds per question. That's plenty of time. Why would anyone ever complain about the time pressure? Jokes aside, this section is brutal. I remember distinctly when I first tried to do a few of these. I can still picture it now. My biology teacher hosted an after school class on application to medicine. And this was one of the questions she showed us just to give us a taste of what the UCAP was like. With no exaggeration, I worked for about 15 minutes on a single abstract reasoning question, trying to figure out what the hell it wanted from me. In the end, I still got the answer wrong. This was honestly a great experience, because then in the future, it showed me just how far I had come. I started out being incredibly slow and knowing absolutely nothing, so by the end, managing to answer all of the questions within the time limit. Now, I didn't get a perfect score, I didn't get a 900 like many other YouTubers, and if you want a picture-perfect account of how they got these scores in their UCAT, then by all means, go ahead and click on their videos. What I'm going to try to do is give you a realistic perspective and show you how I overcame these struggles along the way, so that by the end, I achieved a perfectly respectable score of 680 on this section. There's one massive general tip that I must say before starting out the actual video. Please, please, please do not make huge amounts of notes on every single set of rules that you come across. You're going to be left with a list of rules, and that means absolutely nothing to you. It has no revision potential, and you're not going to be able to do anything with it. This list won't make you any better at actually identifying the patterns. I've seen so many students who do this, and it has provided them with absolutely no value. This being said, taking occasional screenshots of any questions that you find particularly tricky can be useful for revision before the exam, just so that you make sure you cover most of your bases before going into the exam. A much better thing that you could be doing with your time is, you guessed it, practice. That's my motto for the UCAT. I didn't do enough practice and my score did suffer because of it. So please, if there's anything you take away from this video, practice as much as you can. So in this video, I'm going to walk you through four different types of questions that you'll come across when doing abstract reasoning. And for each one, I'll go through an example, giving you very specific tips on how to do well in this type of question as we go along. These tips are going to be based off of both what I did well, as well as my mistakes, and also any other insight that I've gathered from my peers and myself at Cambridge who have tutored and mentored countless hours of UCAT to students around the world. Just a note before we get started, all of the questions I use are available for free on MedEntry. I'll put the link to this website below. So question type one is the two sets of shapes, set A and set B. These sets serve as a stem for then five further answer shapes, where with each answer shape, you must put down whether you think that this shape belongs to set A, set B, or neither. I usually approach these by figuring out a pattern for each of the two sets. This can be done quite efficiently by looking at the simplest box within each set and trying to figure out what the pattern is from there. Then you can progressively look at other boxes and see if your pattern is consistent amongst the boxes of the set. You can then look at set B and try to find a related pattern in set B. Okay, so let's work through an example just to give you a taste of what it's like. Okay, so we have two sets here, set A and set B. For this question, looking at the fourth box in set A, there is one plus, one circle, and two x's. Looking at, for example, this sixth box, there are two pluses and two circles. Looking at the next most simple one, there are two pluses, two circles, and one x. So from here, I can immediately see there are equivalent numbers of circles and pluses, and that the x's are irrelevant. So now we have a general rule, let's move on to set B and see what we find. Let's look at this box, for example. We have three pluses and three circles. Looking at the first box, we have two circles, two pluses, and two x's. So again, the x's seem to be irrelevant, and we seem to have the same rule, that for each plus there is a circle. Now obviously they can't have the same rule, so there must be a further rule. So if we want to discriminate between the two, it's most likely that we have to look at the colors. So looking at set A again, the circle and the plus in this square are opposite colors. If we look at set B, there is one plus and one circle, and they're the same color. So my guess for the rule would be that for set A, a black plus equals a white circle, and a white plus equals a black circle. And in set B, a black plus equals a black circle, and a white plus equals a white circle. Now we can go ahead and actually answer the questions. Does the following shape belong to set A, set B, or neither? Looking at this, it has four pluses, three of which are white and one black, and three circles three black, one white. This has the same number of circles and pluses, so it must be in either A or B, and these are of opposite colors, so it's going to be set A. 
Question two. There are three circles and three pluses. And again, they are opposite colors. So it's set A again. Question three. Three circles and three pluses. These, again, are opposite colors. So this is going to be set A. Question four. There are three circles, three pluses, but we have two black pluses and two black circles. And one white plus and one white circle. This means that this must be set B. And finally, question five. We have four pluses, but only three circles. Therefore, this must be neither. As you can see from that example, once we got the rules, it was really straightforward to just answer the questions in quick succession. It wasn't very much thinking, and you could really just do them like this. So once you do get the hang of them, 14 seconds isn't actually that unreasonable. It's important to note that with these questions, the neither option can be either for when the shape does not belong to neither set A or set B, but also for when it belongs to both. Now this is rare, and it's unlikely that you'll come across this in the exam, but it is important to keep this in mind just in case you get stuck. Let me give you some tips for type 1 questions. Some websites or books or tutoring companies will give you acronyms. Now personally, I don't like using these at all. This is for one reason. They're slow. If you have an acronym of 10 letters and you want to go through each letter for each pattern, that's going to take ages. You're just not going to have the time to go through everything that systematically. Now obviously, if using an acronym works for you, then go for it. But if you're at the point where you have to write down an acronym every time you want to do one of these questions, it's just not time efficient and you really shouldn't be doing this. Another tip is to start with the simplest box within a set. Every box of a set must obey all the rules. If you start with the simplest box, this is going to have the least distracting information and will allow you to get to the rules more quickly. A third tip is to compare set A and set B when you're unsure. This is because their rules will often be contradictory or related, and therefore finding a rule for set A will make it much easier to find a rule for set B. Another tip is if you're stuck, go with your gut and just guess. There's no time to be doubling back and thinking about questions over and over again. You have 14 seconds a question. Don't waste time when you could be getting questions right elsewhere. If you have absolutely zero idea what the rule is, then what I'd recommend is to put all of your answers either A or B. This way, you're likely to get at least some of them correct. This is because sometimes rules, by their design, just don't have an either. So putting A or B gives you a higher chance of getting it right than you would have putting either. So all of the tips I've given you are applicable to type 2 questions, which we're going to go through now. Type 2 questions are very similar to type 1, but instead of asking you which set it belongs to, it tells you to pick a shape out of 4 that would fit into a particular set. Let's do an example. Okay, so looking at AR2, we have set A and set B. We can look at the obvious. There are four arrows per box, each of them seemingly pointing in random directions. Some of them are shaded, some of them are not. So having a brief glance at this, we can tell that all of the boxes in set A have an odd number of shaded arrows, and all the boxes in set B have an even number of shaded arrows. So this is about all the information you can really get from just a quick glance. Let's move on to the actual questions, as these will provide us clues as to what patterns we're looking for with the sets. Okay, so we're looking for the shape that belongs in set A. Set A had odd numbers, so we can immediately cancel C out. So apart from that, we don't really know what's going on, but we can tell that the main discriminating feature between these arrows is the way in which their bars are oriented. These are horizontal bars, these are vertical, these are vertical, horizontal, and vertical. So let's look at the shapes in set A and see what kind of arrows they have. So all of these in set A seem to be vertical arrows. Looking at set B, all of them seem to be horizontal. So now looking back at the question, we can tell that both shape A and shape D have horizontal bars. So the answer must be B. Which of the following shape belongs in set B? So we can immediately cancel out B, and we can immediately cancel out D, as it has vertical bars. Now how do we discriminate between A and C? This is a bit more weird. Where they seem to be identical, but A has the first and fourth corner filled, whereas C has the second and third corner. Looking at set B, it always has two shapes filled, and they're always in the second and third corner. Therefore, we know that the answer must be C. Looking at question three, we're looking for an odd number of shapes with vertical bars, therefore it must be C. Let's move on to question five, because question four isn't the best. So we're looking for an even number of shapes with horizontal bars in these two corners. So it must be C. Type 2 questions are really quite similar to type 1 questions in that once you figure out the rules, it's quite easy to just go ahead and do the question. However, with type 2 questions, I would suggest going through and figuring out the rules as you go along. If you try to figure out all of the rules that exist before actually attempting the question, then you might not really need anything more, and you'll be able to discriminate between all of the shapes that they give you without putting in any extra and unnecessary effort. So moving on to question type 3. This is a series of shapes that changes from one box to the next, and you need to identify which is the final box of the pattern. Let's do a practice question to show you what I mean. So looking at AR3 here, let's break it down. We have four pentagons with 
generally two shapes within each one. Let's take a look at the circle first. The circle starts off in this corner, let's call this corner one, as a black circle, and then moves to this corner, corner three, as a white circle. Then it moves to corner five as a black circle, and then corner two as a white circle. Therefore, we can tell that the circle is moving two spots with each box, and it's alternating from black to white. So we know that the next circle is going to be black, cancelling out A, and we know that it's going to be in this position. So we can cancel out B. Next, we can look at the square. So the square always seems to be unfilled, and it goes from position five to position four to position three, I'm guessing to position two. So then it's going to end up down here at position one. So we know that C is going to be the correct answer. This type of question does get really repetitive. Once you get the hang of it, it is probably the easiest question in abstract reasoning, just because you can do them like this. Make sure to not spend too much time on these, as for each question, there is a new rule. So it's not like you're figuring out one rule and then applying it to five questions. Instead, you're just doing single questions at a time, which obviously doing one of those questions in 14 seconds can be a bit more time pressured than doing a set of five questions in 70 seconds. It is important to note that sometimes the rule isn't consistent throughout the four boxes, and it can alternate from box box 1 to box 3 to then box 5. If a question is more complex, then it's worth looking at the actual answers before fully attempting to try figuring out all the rules. This is because if you're indecisive between, let's say, three test shapes, then you can look at what differentiates between these shapes and then try to apply that to the sample boxes. And if it fits, then it's probably the right answer. And instead, do the question by elimination rather than trying to figure out all the rules and getting to the right answer that way. So moving on to question type 4, I call this the a is to B, what C is to X. Basically, this takes the principles of similar shapes that you must have covered in like year seven or something, but instead of with pure numbers, it works with symbols and shapes. This is probably the easiest question type as there's less distracting information, but again, you do only have 14 seconds to answer it. Let's do an example question. So this is quite a tricky example image, but we can tell a couple of things right off the bat. Firstly, we can look at this pentagon. It's gone from the outside shape to the inner shape and it is flipped on the horizontal axis. Therefore, we can look at our shape and say, okay, it's going to go from the outside to the inside, and it's going to flip. We can also see that it went from being filled in to striped. So we can probably assume that from striped, it'll go to filled in. So this will be filled in. Looking at the answers, we can immediately cancel out a few of them. We can cancel out B and C. C because the shape is the wrong orientation, and B because the shape is the wrong color. Looking at A versus D, we can tell that the only thing that differentiates them is the color of these two arrows. So for this, we'll need to look at the color of the triangles. So the only white triangle in shape A goes from the top to the bottom right. So it has moved one place clockwise. If we look at our arrow here, it's going from the right, and it's going to move one position clockwise. So it's going to move to down here. So using this information, A must be the correct answer. Okay, I've been talking for too long now, and I really hope this has helped. If you want to watch other videos, then I'll have a UCAT video up here and a different one up here. So feel free to watch those if, if you want. If you, if you don't, then don't watch them, I guess. But that, that, that's up to you. You can do what you want. But, but they're up here, so, so go watch those.